so it's uh, it's eight o'clock. So uh, I will get started. Um, well, you should all be looking at my slideshow. Yes. Yes. All right. Good. Uh, you scared me a bit there, Larry. When you said that you were looking at yourself, I would have expected you to have seen the slideshow because that's what I had shared. Um, Anyway, welcome to my channel, Functional Update. Uh, I will try and keep this short as usual uh, to let you all know what's going on in the channel. Um, but before I start, um, I'm actually going to open up a different tab. Um, I get asked frequently about who our channel partners are. Um, and I just wanted to point everybody to the resellers page, the about.gitlab.com slash resellers page, um, where you will see a list of who all of the current resellers are. And you can even narrow that down by physical territory by clicking on the various different maps you see there. Um, the only one who's not listed and, um, and who won't be listed until, you know, they're, they're fully onboarded are new partners that have been brought on board. So until they give me their, their listing, you won't see them here. Usually that's a matter of a couple of weeks after they get brought on board. Uh, all right, so to go back and start, so to give a, a bit of a status on some ups and some downs, um, in this in the last six weeks since my last update, um, we've had quite a few pluses. Um, we did a channel partner, uh, or pardon me, uh, one of our channel partners release team got us listed on the GSA, um, which is new for us and should be uh, uh, quite handy. I know that Paul Almeida is working on uh, other methods uh, of getting us listed on the GSA, particularly through a fulfillment partner um, who I'm not going to name now. Um, uh, but in the meantime, at least we are going to be on the GSA and have the ability to sell through that. Uh, we also completed uh, basic SE training for the resellers. So Xiaogang Wen, um, who is responsible for technical enablement of the channel, um, put together uh, some, some trainings, a series of three trainings that he ran six times um, so that way we covered all the different time zones um, to run the SEs from our resellers through some training to better enable them to both talk about our product and, and uh, to allow them to be able to demonstrate uh, our product with confidence. Uh, we also created a reseller Slack channel. So if you look at Slack, this is, there's a channel called Reseller and we invited the uh, resellers to that Slack channel. Um, to better facilitate communication. Uh, some of them are more active than others, uh, but that's to be expected. Uh, so if you have uh, questions for the channel as a whole, you can probably ask it there. And it also gives you the ability to select individual uh, resellers, which is probably a whole lot more handy than having a, a, a particular channel. Um, channel, oops. Move forward a slide on. I said the channel brought forward 15 opportunities or won 15 opportunities uh, in the last five weeks, uh, which isn't which isn't so bad. Um, and we have expanded the network. We've got more resellers. So I'll talk more about that on the next slide. Uh, and we've begun a badging program for the resellers to uh, prove their technical expertise both to us and to their customer base. Um, and I'm going to have more on that on the slide after next. So some of the downsides is we have not published a channel newsletter since December uh, with the departure of our channel marketing manager who has, and no one has been replaced to take over his duties. We haven't done that. And that uh, is, he was the one who was publishing the newsletter. That newsletter uh, is actually fairly important because the uh, it keeps the resellers abreast of what is new in each of our releases that, that gets pushed to them as something that they that is easy for me to track that they've been reading. You can't really count on them to read our blog posts every day or anything like that. Um, it's got other stuff in there too, like which events are coming up that we're going to be participating in and so forth um, so that they can then leverage that in their uh, own individual marketing messages. Um, and we really need to get that back on track. Um, along along those lines, most of the members of our channel still haven't had a press release and it's a late for a lot of them to have a press release. It doesn't make much sense to actually release it to the press, but listing a press release on our website gives them a legitimacy and um, to where they can point their customers at and say, see, look, I really am a, 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 a partner of, of GitLab. Um, you can see, you know, the announcement there. Um, so we really need to get that back on track. Again, that was what the channel marketing manager was doing. Um, and uh, so we really missed that role. So on to expansion. Um, so last week we signed a new reseller called Fierce Software. Uh, Fierce is a federally focused reseller. They're uh, based out of the Maryland DC area, um, focused on selling to the federal government and federal government contractors. 
Um, Fierce is actually kind of a, a company with two parts to it. Um, there's the smaller part uh, is, a, is a group of five or six guys who and gals who sell to the government. And then they have a, a, a broader company with many, many more employees that are consultants that get placed out to do implementation gigs and what have you. Um, at government companies. Um, they they also work with Puppet, so they've been in our space for quite a while, uh, and they're well known to our federal um, uh, sales director, Mark Almi or, pardon me, Paul Almeida, um, who's the one who actually referred them to us. Uh, we also have verbal agreements um, with two contracts out in Certify awaiting signature. Um, one is for an Italian-based reseller, uh, and again, I'm not going to name names here because this is a public broadcast and we have NDAs until they sign their agreements. Um, the Italian based reseller uh, actually has brought us three customers already who have signed um, and they were customers that we weren't in before. So um, while I'm not necessarily keen to, to sign up a bunch of resellers in EMEA because you know Page has got a good direct team there, the fact that they're bringing us deals that we didn't have before makes them certainly worthwhile to bring forward. And also uh, a reseller based in Taiwan um, who I've known for many, many years, uh, is, uh, has also said that they're going to come on board. Um, I'm in negotiations with several others. One that's really interesting is there's a ger German ALM tool vendor that has an ALM tool that wants to embed GitLab in the tool so that they sell GitLab as part of their solution. Um, and we're really close to having an, an agreement signed there. As a matter of fact, we've even agreed to speak at their user conference, which is coming up here in, in about a month and a half. Timo um, on Pages team is going to go out and give a presentation in German on the value of GitLab to their to their customer base. Um, we're also really close, really close to having a, uh, a Japanese-based uh, reseller. It's not necessarily the, the market penetrating Japanese-based reseller I would prefer, um, but uh, these guys do a bunch of consulting work. Good uh, names on their list, so uh, that should be quite good. By the way, I expect all these in negotiations to be done by the end of this year. Um, also, uh, a, a reseller, and I said the, the Comunidad Andina. What Comunidad Andina is, is a free trade zone in South America that most people haven't heard of. It, it comprises of uh, Colombia, Peru, Ecuador, and Bolivia. Um, doesn't necessarily sound to a lot of people like a big market, but it's, you know, uh, put together, it's it probably about the size of, of uh, uh, France or Germany uh, in, in market size. So it makes it, you know, fairly uh, uh, uh prosperous um, as, a, as a whole, even though it's a very large area. Um, and so they have a reseller there who's sold to almost every government agency you could imagine in the Andes, um, and they're quite keen to get on board. They are also a Red Hat partner. They are big into the, in the open source community, um, and, and they've got a lot of experience there, which is where they were attracted to us in the first place. And last but certainly not least, I have a mid-tier SI that um, is, is – already working with us and, and, and going to be signing a contract. Um, and they're going to, they're going to do a couple of different things for us. Um, uh, one is going to expand the number of available consultants that we can uh, have our customers engaged that will be, have an official relationship with us as well as they are also looking at and have done work to put together a replacement for get host, uh, running on AWS. Um, and, uh, so we should be able to have a single tenant hosted provider being resold by this particular reseller moving forward. Well, I hope to, ha to have that completed by the end of this month, it, but it may take slightly longer, um, but I think that'll be uh, really good moving forward. So on to the, on to the badging. So the purpose behind reseller badging is to give the, uh, uh, both a sense of legitimacy to the resellers where they can go to their customers and say, look, I am certified um, uh, by GitLab that I know what I'm doing. And it's also to help protect our brand because they're going to tell the customers if there are resellers that they already know what they're doing. And this way it allows us to at least monitor and have control over some of, um, uh, of what they're saying and doing. Um, I put the, I put GitLab Virtuoso in quotes. That was sort of a name that Reb and I were throwing around about a year ago to call this, this program. It still doesn't really have a name, although that one's not all that bad. Um, the first iteration of this program is, um, is, is in process. Um, and uh, it's going to change and evolve over time. That's why I'm calling it version 0.5. And right now, it's uh, Xiao Gang put it together, um, and he's got a lot of experience doing that. He put together the badging program for Electric Cloud before he came to join us. 
Um, and he's had some help with Reb, who put together the certification testings for Perforce before he joined us. So we've got a, a, a good team working on making that work. Both of them have experience in doing it before. Um, and it consists of five to six different modules with different subjects that are basically self-paced studies. So, you know, watch these videos, read this data. Um, and uh, when you've done that, you get a, uh, uh, a hands-on assignment from Shao Gang that says, here, do this, and I'll review it with you when you're done, and we'll, we'll see if you, if, you, if you really know how to do it, and then a test at the end of each module. They're designed so that it can be completed, each one of them can be completed in a, in a week or less, um, in your quote spare time. So uh, hardly anybody wants to, to, to dedicate having six weeks of nothing but training in order to get a badge. It's not worth it um, to a, a, a reseller to, to, for that expense. And so this design so it'll fit into the time slot of one of their consultants without making them um, uh, unbillable for, the, for an entire week at a time. Um, one of the requirements of the badging program is that they're going to have to contribute to our source. And that's, um, that's really powerful because when they go to tell their customers, they know what they're doing, they can say, and I helped write GitLab. And that's really powerful. Um, right now, we've got five resellers that we invited to this round because this is sort of the test first round um, with nine people registered. And those nine humans have all received the first module already and have begun work on it. Uh, big big hands out to Shell Gang for making that happen in such a quick in a, uh, manner. The modules that he has planned so far um, are the seven listed here, and I'm not going to read them to you because I'm assuming we all know how to read. Um, yeah, this could change over time. As a matter of fact, the whole badging program could change over time. Uh, the goal of it is, is to, to provide legitimacy and protect our brand, and I think we can do that if we're sure that our uh, that the consultants that are partners have skills that match what we have listed here. And if we need more skills or different skills, that can change uh, as time goes on. Um, along those lines, the future of that program, like I said, um, you know, it'll, it'll change over time. Um, we're also going to ask for yearly recertifications because, well, you know, we have at least 12 releases of our product every year, and some of that includes massive new functionality. Um, and so we need to make sure that they're, they're up in, um, uh, in their skills on the new stuff. Um, the recertifications will be smaller in scope, um, and we're probably going to have specializations as our, as our product uh, moves out. So like a, a specialized CI badge, for instance, um, uh, and, and, and so forth, or, or perhaps cloud native um, uh, transformation uh, and something like that um, to give more credence and things to the, to the particular resellers. And one other sort of update, I probably could have put this uh, on the first slide or earlier, um, is some of the ongoing training. I mentioned that we did the SE trainings um, uh, uh, last quarter for all the resellers. Um, we're going to do, we're going to rehold them again in July for some of the uh, employees of those resellers who missed it, as well as all of the new resellers that we're bringing on board. Um, and we are also starting um, up a regular cadence of trainings for the resellers and telling them what's new on our product. Um, and the first one we're going to have is going to be, uh, oops, that says July, I should say June. Uh, Shock angle, correct me on that. There we go. Um, the first one's going to be in June, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to concentrate on what has changed between the last time he ran the SE training and now, so in other words, a quarter's worth of releases. Hey, here's what our new features, and here's, here's how they work, and here's why they should be important to your customers. All right, so I am going to bring up the chat window now. If I could find that out. Uh, All right, and let's see if I can answer some questions here. Okay. Da, 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 da. Starts at the beginning. Welcome, Larry. Welcome, Larry. We're in the world of you, Larry. Woo hoo, woo. I say so. The federal government says GSA is big. Awesome. Hi, right, Marco. Michael, there's some confusion over just what partners can access in Salesforce. Uh, actually, Mark, there, there isn't. So, uh, the resellers have access to Salesforce.com. Um, they can see objects that they own. So if you see a, a, uh, a contact or an opportunity or a lead or an account that is, says that the owner is something, something partner user, they can see that. 
Um, they also have the ability to access objects associated with those. So if there's a contact associated to an opportunity they own, and if they don't own that contact, they can still see it. Um, they also have the ability to see things where they are listed on the account team or the opportunity team. So if, for instance, if I put uh, a release team on uh, the account team for Lawrence Livermore National Labs, for instance, um, then they will get to see everything associated with that account that even if they don't own it. Um, a, typically that will happen when a reseller is working on a, on a deal that's owned by someone else, but only for the life of that deal. Um, that uh, answer your question? You know, mute yourself and tell me. Yes, thank you, Michael. You're welcome. Uh, oh, Molly already answered that for you. All right, thanks, Molly. Uh, da -da -da -da. Awesome, get that host. Single host provider is awesome. Single host provider. Can the single host provider cover the customers globally? Um, so the, the the company that I'm talking about is going to do that. They they're the platform that they're going to actually host it on. The actual web provider is going to be AWS, just like we used to host it on DigitalOcean. Um, and you know, AWS is indeed global. I don't know what data centers are considering um, utilizing for this service. My guess is it's going to be whatever the customer asks them to do. Um, yeah, they're very sort of mercenary that way, and they'll do whatever a customer wants. Um, but I don't really know the the answer to that properly. This is a cover global market story. So, uh, which resellers have which resellers have started the badging? Um, I can answer that, Molly. Um, I'd rather not do that here, as this recording is 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 public. Um, and uh, uh, so I'll, I'll answer you offline on, on who has begun it. Um, the reason I want to mention it is because perhaps some of them might not finish it, and I don't want to cause um, anybody some sort of grief on that at the moment. Um, Mark Bell, is badging program targeted more at server providers or resellers? Yes. <laughs> um, so every single one of our resellers, um, other than the OEM resellers like Perforce, um, make a, a bunch of money by selling services. Okay, so uh, even the guys who make most of their money selling product like uh, ALM Toolbox in Israel, um, they also make a bunch of money selling um, uh, services. And so so the answer is yes, there's a, there are some resellers who are mainly interested in selling services and there are some who are, are most interested in selling product, but all of them um, are interested in, in, in being batched. Uh, Great, thank you. From City, considering documenting what the resellers can see in the handbook, if not done already. Okay, Sid, so we can do that. Um, I'm wondering if it's already there because Francis did something about that a while back. I'll, I'll check. I'll check. Uh, they can see Cheddar's is ceiling when you select all of access. Yes, Molly. Here's what percent of revenue goes through the channel today. Um, I don't know. I can I can look up that total. I get uh, at the the first uh update that i gave at the beginning of the year gave the aggregate number for last year i haven't looked for what the number is so far this year um the amount that's gone through the channel in q1 this year dwarfs what went through the channel in q1 last year um mainly because in q1 last year we really didn't have a channel um <laughs> and uh and so so they're new now um or, or so that, so a lot of them have had a year's worth of experience now um and my next functional update i could probably give that uh give give that number all right. Uh, anybody have any other questions um, before I give you 10 minutes of your morning back? And hey, Michael, just for uh, some folks international, maybe just explain what the GSA is and kind of the importance of, of being listed on it. Sure, sure. Actually, if, if Paul is on the line, he would be a better person to answer that question. Um, you hear Paul? Yeah, it doesn't sound like it. So what the GSA is... Hey, Michael, I, I could take it. This is Brent. All right, Brent, go for it. Um, hey, GSA is just one of those uh, contract vehicles that kind of gets a lot of um, government red tape out of the way. If you are on a GSA contract, there are certain things the software and the company has to meet to even get on there. So there's a, about a lot of government check boxes that it covers. So um, it also provides usually a small discount uh, so people can be assured they're getting the best price. 
So just one of those government vehicles, sometimes uh, it's easier to order off GFSA and saves a lot of red tape. Yeah, so it's a, it's a U.S. federal government purchasing program, one, one of many, but probably the most popular one. All right. All right, everybody. Uh, have another 10 minutes back to your morning. Thanks for uh, coming and listening.